Well, hi everyone. Thank you for watching. Today I'm with Gary Lockett, professional boxing trainer and former professional fighter. Gary challenged for the WBC and WBO middleweight world titles in his professional career and also won the WBU world title as well. Uh, now working as a professional boxing trainer, like I said, with a host of talent at his gym, has uh, having a lot of success at his gym. And today we're going to be talking about his life and career so far, as well as his future plans. So Gary, thank you for taking the time to talk with me. I, I appreciate that very much. Pleasure, no problem. Okay, so I mean, let's, um, let's start at the beginning then. I mean, I'm gonna sort of talk a little bit about your own career, like I just said. So, you know, look, look back a bit and then look forward. Uh, I wonder the place I'm gonna start with is, is um, you know, going back a few years now, obviously you were training with the late, great uh, Enzo Calzaki. Uh, and I'm actually going to, at a point in time, and I'm actually going to start there because I'd like to discuss a few of your key fights. I'd like to discuss, um, obviously, the world title fight and a few things around there. But starting at the beginning, training with Enzo is something, it's something I've always wanted to ask you about anyway, uh, working with him over the years. What was that experience like um, broadly? I don't have a particular question about it, but just, I'm just opening that subject up. Um, what was the experience like training with, with him? Well, let's just backtrack. I mean, obviously, um, I think everybody everybody gets it wrong. Everybody thinks I trained with Enzo all my career. I was only with Enzo for the last three fights of my career. So, you know, my, the main of my career was in Liverpool and Manchester. Um, I turned pro in Liverpool with uh, with John Highland, who at the time had had a, con a big TV contract with ITV. Um, and then after about seven fights, I moved on then to... I was with Matchroom. I was training with Colin Moorcroft in Liverpool. Um, and then... After about seven fights in matchroom, then I moved on with Frank Warren, um, and I was with Frank Warren then from I think 2001 until the end of my career, 2008, um, when my son was born. Jack was born. I didn't want to keep going away training to Manchester because obviously at that age, you know, you leave them for a week, and when you come back, their little faces have changed, and you know, I didn't want to miss that. So um, I went to the you know the best trainer around in in Wales, you know, with a gym full of champions, and I was Enzo. So um, you know, if we can move on, then your, your question was obviously what was it like? What was it like training with Enzo? Look, it was it was, it was great, and um, uh, you know, Enzo Enzo Macronelli and, and Gavin Reese and, and obviously Joe Calzaghe, um, amongst others at the time. Obviously, there was there was Nathan Cleverly there who was still with Enzo. There was Kerry Hope who was still with Enzo, and there was a couple of others as well, um, Bradley Price as well. So um, it was a good place to be around and obviously success breeds success, doesn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely it does, yes. So, okay, so let's talk about um, uh, a couple of your key fights. Well, actually, mm -hmm. before we get there, I'm going to open it up again more broadly. I mean, in your, yeah. your boxing career itself, was there for you a moment, uh, maybe not just one, maybe more than one, that was like the proudest moment for you, you know, the thing that, that you look back on? Maybe it was a world title challenge, but I'm not going to assume that. Maybe it was something else. What was the, the proudest moment um, for you in your career? Well, it certainly wasn't the world title challenge because I boxed, I boxed an elite fighter, uh, the number two in the pound for pound rankings by the Rig magazine, and I got, I got stopped in three rounds because he was just a, you know, a level above me. But I mean, look, I'll go right back to when I was 14 years of age, and um, you know, I, I'm repeating myself because I did a podcast the other day. I said exactly the same thing. It's probably a little bit unusual because I won. I won the WBO Intercontinental in the pros and I beat a, a very, very good fighter called Kevin Kelly to win that title. Now, Kevin, had he, he challenged for the WBA title and a lot of people thought he won that fight and he'd been a double Commonwealth champion and he was a very, very clever fighter. And I won that, uh, the WBO. It was supposed to be for the Commonwealth title. Now, the, I, I think at the time I'd had um, 15 fights. Now, the board deemed me too inexperienced to box for the Commonwealth title. So Frank Warren's people then made it for the WBO Intercontinental and I won it by fourth round KO, thus robbing me the chance of winning the Commonwealth title. But um, I also, you know, I won the WBU and, you know, I know what a lot of people say is it's worthless. Well, maybe so, but, you know, I was earning very good money for that. There were some good champions at the time and there was Ricky Hatton, Enzo Macronelli, uh, amongst others. Um, and it was, you know, we earned good money for those title fights and I beat some good opponents as well. I mean, I beat Ryan Rhodes in my first defense. And at the time we were both very highly rated by the WBO. So, you know, if that fight had been for the WBO title, then nobody would have said any different, you know? Um, but then 
in answer to your question, I'll take myself all the way back to when I was 14 years of age. I think I'd won three Welsh schoolboy titles. I'd failed uh, in the British schoolboy uh, uh, semi-finals a couple of times. I'd, I'd, I had a couple of controversial decisions. Then there was a competition called Daily Star Golden Gloves, which was very, very prestigious. It was um, all four nations. It was England, Wales, Ireland and Scotland, the champions of all those get together in a two semi-finals and a final. Um, and I stopped, I stopped, and, and I was a year young really, because not really a year young, but I'm younger in the year. So I'm at the end of November and the competition was in calendar years. So the two boys I boxed were sort of a year older than me in school. So I boxed the, the school, the school, the British school boy finalist a year above me in the semi-final. And I stopped him in the first round. And then in the final, I boxed a, a formidable um, Dublin fighter called Anthony Dunn. And he, he had about 60 odd fights. He'd only lost three. And I think I was having my, in the final, I was having my 14th or 15th fight. I can't quite remember. And I torrid first round. I got beat up a bit in the first round, but then I stuck to my boxing, won the second and third, and I won it on a unanimous decision. And the feeling of elation at the end of it um, was, you know, I remember it to this day and I was in floods of tears. And I think people thought I'd lost because I was crying, but I was just crying with joys of, uh, tears of joy. So, you know, in my whole career, it didn't matter what I did, but that moment, I never surpassed that moment, I don't think. I think that was the proudest moment for me, my first British title win. That's an amazing, amazing memory and an amazing achievement, uh, 100%. And then following on from that, I mean, you know, this is this next question is something again, you know, you, you've probably talked about this before, but that's OK. In terms of toughest fights, I mean, people throw that around a lot, don't they, in terms of, you know, what's your toughest fight when you have to dig deep, this, that and the other. But for you personally, I mean, um, again, amateur or pro, I, I, I don't mind uh, where we go with that. What was the, you know, the toughest fight that you had, the most difficult, where you, you know, you really had to dig deep and, and uh, everything of that nature, basically? Well, there were there were a few in the amateurs. Um... I mean, I had a real tough fight in, in the European in the European Youth Championships um, in the in the semi-finals. Uh, another Irishman called Anthony 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 Adrian O'Neill. I got mixed mixed with Anthony Dunn. We were just talking about the Golden Gloves. There was a guy called Adrian O'Neill, and um, it was a real tough fight, and it was close. Um, I think I was well up on on points, but I think it was closer than the score. It was one of those, you know. But I stopped him in the third. But that was a very tough fight. Um, I had many a tough fight in, in the British Championships, uh, the NABCs. Um, as a pro, um, look, you know, Ryan Rhodes was a very tough fight. I think it was the only time, it's the only time I've been legitimately dropped by by a punch, you know, against Pavlik, I think. You know, I went down three times, but I was under a lot of pressure and I was trying to take a knee to try, try to clear my head. Um, and I was down another time in my fifth or, fifth or sixth pro fight, but it was one of those where your feet are together. You kind of get hit, your feet are together, and you go on, you slide on your bum. Um, but Ryan, I could still feel the shot now, and he dropped me in the tenth round, and um, I, I got up to and I finished strongly, and I won the fight in the end. Um, but you know that was a tough fight. Obviously, the Pavlik one. You know, I, I know I know it's a lot of people. They try to avoid the one. They say no, that wasn't the toughest fight, but. Obviously, you know, he was the best guy that I ever fought. Um, a monster at the time. Very, very, very big for the weight. Um, not the biggest not the biggest puncher with one punch. I, I'd say Ryan Rhodes was a bigger one punch hitter, but he was just relentless. Very good long jab, good fitness. And once he had you in trouble, he, he sort of he stayed on you and never let you off the, off the hook. I mean... You know, we've talked about the World Title Challenge, and I know it's, it's something, because um, I've, I've only got a couple more, really, about your actual pro career before we get to the training. But mm. I do want to touch on, you know, on the World Title uh, fight itself. But before we get there, I'd like to touch on the, on the WBU, because obviously you won that. Mm. Um, I think it's a very big achievement. I mean, I, I know there's controversy around uh, that particular belt and everything. But still, I mean, you, you know, you won a world title there, and you got to sort of the top of the mountain, as they say, in that in that way, what what did it feel like? I mean, I'm sure winning a world title is something you have to experience to, to fully, um, you know, to fully appreciate it. But you know, I mean, after um, you know all the fights that you'd had, after you know all the work that you'd put in, you, you know, like I say, you still got to the the top of the mountain with that. I mean, what what was that experience actually like in itself? Well, again, before people criticise me, you know, I never have, I never regarded myself as being. A genuine world champion because obviously the WBU didn't fit into the top four. But mm -hmm. 
No, it, it was it was good. I mean, to win any title, um, I suppose, is, is good. You know, I was, some of the titles which have been sort of, um, they've been taken out of, taken out now, the, the British Masters and the, the International Masters. You know, I, I wouldn't have felt that I was any kind of champion winning one of those. But for someone who turns pro with no amateur career, um, having had, you know, only a few amateur fights, a title like that to them would mean the world. You know, so I, I wouldn't disrespect any title. But for me, you know, to win any title, the British Commonwealth, European, um, an intercontinental title, um, but one of the fringe world titles like the IBO or the WBU, I mean, to me, to me, it was a stepping stone. And it was, you know, I was a kid. Um, I think the, a lot of people, you know, they go into it and they think, I want to fight the best. I want to... You know, I want to get to the, the, the furthest place I can be. Whereas I was a little bit more business-like about it because, you know, it's exactly the way I am with my fighters. You know, you get the guy to the position he needs to be by avoiding sometimes the best fighters. So as when you do get in, in, in the big fight, then it's for a lot of money. Uh, and, that, and that was a way that I, I always thought of things. And, you know, I could have fought for the British title, um, for let's say 15 grand. But then when I had the WBU title shot, it was double the money. So it's a no brainer really, you know, what do you do? Do you go for prestige or do you go for money? And as a um, thinking, thinking like a businessman, then you obviously go for, for, for what's the most money. And it turned out to be the right, the right way to go as well, because I had some good defenses. Um, I, I was supposed to box Ryan Rhodes <clears throat> to fight for the title. Ryan injured his back. And I got left in a fight with Gilbert Eastman, who was at, uh, Howard East, Howard East, the champion middleweight, his brother. And I stopped him in the first round, but I defended against Ryan. And then I defended against an, a guy who had actually beaten Ryan, Lee Blundell, who was a big, tall, gifted southpaw. Um, and I earned some good money. And, um, you know, there were some good fights. I, and I think <clears throat> that shot me further up the rankings to eventually have the shot at Pavlik for the WBC, WBO and, and Ring Magazine's belts. But um, we won't talk about that one. <laughs> OK, all right, so we'll leave that one out. OK, fair yeah. enough, fair enough. No, 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 I'm just joking. I'm just no, joking. Well, it can, I mean, it's the last one I was going to talk about. It's yeah. up to you if you want to. Yeah, yeah, carry I mean, on, I'm just joking. I, I, no, OK. Well, I, I mean, like I said before, I mean, challenging for a world title in itself is, is uh, an achievement in itself. And it's something a lot of fighters obviously never even you know, get to that point to even yeah. challenge for it. So it's still an amazing uh, achievement. And I and I, I can sort of tell that maybe you, you're a bit like that about your performance, but still it's, it's an achievement. So, you know, what did you think of the fight? I mean, as you say, you know, fighting best in the world, um, mm. three bouts on the line, you know, obviously in America as well. I, I mean, what was, the, what was the whole experience like in terms of the build up to the fight, in terms of the fight itself? Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on, on the whole thing? I mean, I know I'm opening that up a bit, wider than just just one question but what are your thoughts on on the whole experience that you had um with that fight basically yeah i mean when, when we were in the welsh awards um i think it was back in september wasn't it september or october something like that well i myself tony borg and, and nikki piper were up there doing a, um, a question and answer a q a um and i was asked about the the title fight and you know it's like i explained uh you know sometimes you have a shot at the WBO title and it will be a vacant title because the champion's given it up and you get matched with someone who isn't really that great. You know, it might be someone who's number three or four in the rankings. Now all these rankings, they rate certain people from certain countries. I don't really know the reason why. Venezuela um, is the, the WBA is, is Venezuelan origin. So they always rank somebody in the, you know, from Venezuela in their rankings. I'm talking about something similar to that. So you might get left in, in, a, in a vacant title fight with Joe Bloggs, who you look at him, you think, well, he's not really that good. And then you beat that guy and then you're world champion without having beaten a world champion. Do you understand? Yeah. When I had my title shot, <laughs> it happened to get, be against Kelly Pavlik. And that's just, the, that's just, you know, the cards that you're dealt. Sometimes, you know, you, you get a vacant title shot against someone who's, you know, you, you fancy chances against and sometimes you know you have to fight um someone like Kelly Pavlik same as Michael Jennings my friend he had to fight Miguel Cotto um and then you know there's so many over the years but it's a funny story I told in in, in the awards I basically said you know we 
I was WBO number one contender. Uh, I got made mandatory then. So we basically thought that Pab- Pavlik had been fighting sort of Edison Miranda. He'd fought uh, Jermaine Taylor a couple of times. So he was at, at this level. So we thought, nah, there's no way he's going to want to fight me. I'm not a big enough name. So we think he'll vacate the title. So we looked at the number two, and the number two was Sebastian Zivit from, from, from Germany. And, you know, I looked at that fight, and I thought, well, you know, I think Frank will win the purse bids and, and maybe get home advantage for that. And, you know, I'd have a very, very good chance. You know, I was, I was more than confident. And then the one morning, um, uh, I was having my breakfast. I was getting ready to go to the gym, and I had a phone call off Dean Powell, God, God rest his soul. And he said, Gary, you sat down. And I said, yeah. He said, we've made the Pavlik fight. So I pulled the phone away from my face, and I won't, I won't say what I said. <laughs> um, I mean, look, would I rather fought Sebastian Zivit than Kelly Pavlik? Of course I would have, because, you know, I thought there's a, there's a great chance of me beating Zivit. Don't get me wrong, you know, I was always a puncher, a natural puncher from... From a, from a young age. So, you know, the plan was to go in there and, and, and clip him just to catch him. Um, he, was, he was very long. It was, it was going to be very hard to sort of outbox him. So I tried to get inside and, and clip him. I did clip him in the first round. And I think he was a little bit more alert after that. And um, he kind of stunned me at the end of the first round. And I never, when he gets stunned, um, you see stars. It was almost like in the fight, the stars never went away. So it was almost like I, I was blinded to the shots. Um, but, um, you know, he was, he was a good fighter and he stunned me in the first round and I never really recovered. And uh, hands up, he was, he was far too good for me. It's, it's an amazing insight into it because obviously, you know, you, you don't always see um, what the fighters themselves are going through just by watching the fight or, or whatever. It's, it's mm. only hearing this. So that's a really good insight into it. One thing I do want to touch on there um, that you mentioned, actually, was you mentioned about pressure. Uh, yeah. in, in that fight earlier on and I mean mentally preparing for it um, you, I mean you, you've explained a little bit about what you went through mentally as you know in terms but how I mean did you feel much pressure how did you how did you feel actually going into it were you more excited or I mean I, I know there's probably a mix of things but what, what was the main um, perhaps on a more emotional level is where I'm going were you like going into that uh, into that fight itself I think that you know I've always been a very um a very calm person, you know, I never really used to, I mean, in my younger days, I used to get quite nervous, but then as I grew up, um, I think I was quite assured, um, I, was, I was confident in my own ability. So, you know, it was it was a job, you know, going over there against Pavlik, you know, we were, I was a major, major underdog, you know, nobody gave me any chance. And in the press conference, you know, the American journalists treated me like I was I was complete dirt. And they were like, oh, you know, when, when you've been fighting in these, um, tough man tournaments. So I said to the one, the tough man tournament, I said, I'm a professional boxer. <laughs> you know, I've beat some good names, but they, they just, they just rubbished my chances and, and made me, just made me out to be a, you know, a no hoper. Um, but, you know, I didn't, I didn't let things like that get to me. You know, Pavlik himself was always very, uh, he was always very polite and, you know, very respectful. Um, so, you know, the, the pressure, you know, it, it was, there was a lot of pressure, but as I say, I was always, you know, quite, quite self-assured. Um, and I was pretty confident, you know, if I, if I clipped him, that I could have hurt him the, the same as I hurt anybody else and, uh, and finished the job. Fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. It just, I like to touch on that because it's, it's something, again, it's something that you don't always see. Um, so a lot of people talk about the, you know, the fight itself, but they, you know, you don't always touch on the mental side of it. So I wanted to just get that in there. Moving on um, to something else now, I mean, so I'm sort of transitioning into the training side of things. You mentioned earlier about the um, business side and how, you, you know, you're very business orientated, which is, which is great to hear, actually. In terms of lessons that you've brought over from uh, your professional career to your uh, training career, uh, and I, I'd imagine there's a bit of a sort of a transfer there, because obviously you've been there and done it, you know, you I mean, you know, obviously what the people you're training are going through on, on different levels, financially, mentally, obviously physically, in all areas, really. And again, I'm opening this up fairly broadly. What are some of the things that you've, um, you know, taken from your professional career and sort of transferred to uh, helping the, the boys that you train, basically? That's what I'm asking. Yeah, Liam, it's, it, it's a good question, actually, because when I turned pro, 
um, I turned pro back in 1996 and I turned pro on my own. You know, I didn't, I didn't have anybody to, to, to help me. I didn't have anybody that was pro around me. Um, so, so I turned pro on my own and the guys, I consider the guys that, that are involved in myself and the team to be very, very lucky because they have, uh, excuse my, excuse my language. They, they have their, their, their asses wiped for them in, in a way, you know? So sometimes I think that can be a bad thing because they have, I have, you know, I try to give them, I try not to be just a boxing coach and a manager. I try to be a, like a support outside of the ring. I try to educate them outside of the ring as well. Um, I think it's very, I think it's a very good idea to have, have some form of employment apart from your boxing because there are so many out there that they just rely on their boxing money. And then you just find that, you know, you, you're desperate for the next fight all the time. Um, and I, I think that's a, that's a bad thing. So I think to, to get your education and to have some kind of employment outside of boxing, I think that's a very, very good idea. Within the team, we have, we have our own nutritionist. We have a couple of people we work, we work with, with sort of strength work, strength and conditioning. Don't get me wrong, I don't buy into this whole, I've got a strength and conditioning coach type of thing. You know, I think that it's very, very much overrated. What did Leonard Hearns, Hearns and Hagler, what did they do without their strength and conditioning coach, coaches? They became some of the best fighters that have ever lived. So it has its place, but I think you have to be careful with it because A to B movements can make boxers very stiff. So it has to be monitored. But the guys that we use have already been vetted and monitored. So, so within our camp, we have, you know, we have a couple of good coaches, uh, and we have a support team behind us. Where, with a boxer, as I say, they, they have their backsides wiped for them. So, there's no excuses. There can be no excuses. So, what I'm basically saying in a nutshell is that I, that I try to support them throughout their lives, rather than just the hour and a half or two hours they come to the gym in the morning. Yeah, it's good to hear it like that in a nutshell, as you say, because um, it, to be honest, you've hit the nail on the head because that's where I was going with it. I've seen, well, I've seen for myself, really, that it goes beyond, for you, with the people that you train, it goes beyond just being a job and, and everything. And there's um, other elements involved. There's an element of guidance. It, it, I mean, there is almost, I would say, almost a sort of father figure um, element of it uh, in, in a way in, in a certain way and that's and that's good I mean that's that's you know that's very well needed and, and I certainly think there's a big uh, in, in certain gyms there's a gap for that, that that you sort of fill so that's that's a good thing on the subject of people that you you know that you train and, and whatnot here's a, another one I'm going to throw out there is mm. when somebody comes into the gym when you start training somebody can you sort of tell um, quite early on if they're going to do well or if they're going to go far or is does that or does that process take time um to you know do they have to actually be in certain fights um i mean again i'm opening up like like it's been the theme today i'm opening up a, a, bit, a bit wider with um what we're talking about but that's that's the question really can you tell if someone's going to go far or, or do you have to work with them for a while again it's a good question um there is there's quite a wide range of answers i could give i mean sometimes someone walks in the gym and you just know they just have they have this talent to do anything they want and they can only beat themselves do you understand mm. you know and the, and the worst thing in boxing is that someone gets beaten they get beaten and they fail by their own misgivings rather than because someone else is better than them that's the worst thing in boxing and we've we've had it in wales we've had it with so many in wales um you know i've had a couple of myself I've had a couple of guys, you know, myself, Lewis Reese, a good friend of mine, Tony Doherty. You know, Lewis didn't want to box, really. But, you know, he was in the GB squad. He beat some really good names. And when he turned pro, you know, I think he could have done, he could have done almost anything he liked. But he just wasn't dedicated. He didn't really want it. Tony Doherty, another, a mate of mine, you know, loved Tony to death. But, you know, he could have been anything he wanted to, but he just didn't have the dedication. Um, there's so many we can mention. Um I'm going the long way around with this, Liam. I do apologise. Um, I think some of them, some of them in the first place, you think now they need a little bit of work, and then you put them in the fight, and they're just a lot better than what you think. 
some of them you think they're really good, you put them in the fight and <laughs> they're not really as good as what you think they are. But I just, I just think, in, you know, in general, if someone's very hard working and they're pretty good, then, you know, they, they, they tend to get somewhere. You know, this, this hard work and, and the, the work ethic and dedication is, I think, is what is, is, is the most important. And when you get a fighter who's very talented and they have that work ethic as well, then there's a champion in the making. Brilliant, yeah. It's brilliant to, to hear it. And like I say, I wanted to sort of throw that in there because like yourself, I've seen a lot of them, you know, not get to a certain level. And you think, well, why is that? And I'm not going to mention any names, but I've seen it a lot of times. And it's just, yeah. it's interesting to hear it from, you know, from that side, hmm. which does lead me to something else. I mean, um, if you, I know you have a lot of advice that you can share with, with fighters. And if they want it, they should come to the gym. So uh, I don't need to give away everything here, but just if we had to, um, you know, keep it quite simple, like in a nutshell, if you had to say two, three things that a, that a, that a fighter would uh, really need to succeed, what would they be? Because I know you, you mentioned work ethic, which is obviously, uh, obviously key. I mean, it's like, you know, it's, it's essential. Um, what about, you know, one or two others just that you'd say sort of essential um, qualities, if you like, in, in the individual that they would need to go to achieve their personal best, whatever their personal best is. I mean, you know, that might not be world level, it might be lower level, but as long as that's their best, what would you say that, that they need to achieve, um, that, you know, qualities that they need to achieve that, basically? That's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, of course. I mean, obviously, we've, we've already covered the fact that I think the most important aspect of anything is the work ethic and the dedication. But, you know, you've got to have the right attitude as well. Um, and I think in a world, in a world now where shouting your mouth off and being disrespectful to people is is the norm. Isn't it better just to be respectful of people? I think you get a lot more. You got you get a lot more plaudits by being respectful of people. And I think if if you're in, if you're nice to people and, and listen, there's always going to be needle. It doesn't matter how nice a person you are. When you're in a fight with pressure and whatnot, there's always going to be a little bit of needle. Maybe you fall out with a guy. But I think the way that you carry yourself and the way that you that you behave, I think that's very important as well. So obviously, dedication. I think I just talked about attitude. And obviously, you've got to have some sort of you've you've got to have some sort of strength, haven't you? You've got to have a good, good jab. Maybe you're a puncher. Uh, maybe you, you're a really good boxer, you've got good footwork. So obviously you've got to have some sort of talent. Otherwise, you know, you're not going to get anywhere. Nobody that's completely untalented ever won any titles. So I think, you know, dedication, attitude, and just overall, you know, ability and, uh, and self-confidence as well. Because, you know, there's so, there's so many fighters that, so many fighters, they say, oh, you know, I didn't think I was going to win that. And you just look at them stupid. And, you know, there's a lot of fighters who are very, very, very good, but they just don't believe in themselves. And I think, you know, our mutual friend, Jay Harris, you know, in the, in the early days, he used to be very, very nervous. And, um, you know, he'd say after, he'd say, oh, thank, thank God that's over till the next one. I said, what do you mean? Oh, you know, he, and his, his dad, Pete, said he's, he's, the one, he's the only one that doesn't know how good he is. So, you know, self-confidence is also very important as well. So, um, you know, I hope that covers your question. It does. It does very, very, very much. Um, be better than I hoped, really, actually. In that. Um, but yeah, again, it's, it's another one of those things which, which I feel is not always talked about openly. I mean, it might be talked about, you know, behind, behind closed doors and whatnot. But then, of course, you know, fighters watching this, you know, they pick up on that, uh, on those points. And, well, you know, it may well help someone. So, I mean, that's... Well, hopefully that's, so. Hopefully you know, so. That's, that's really the aim, you know. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, there is the attitude of that I have if you know you've got it or you, you haven't in certain respects but then there's, there's, a, there's a lot you can, people can do to improve themselves so um yeah. so that's, that's the reason for throwing that in there yeah. now you mentioned Jay Harris and obviously um you know he's just come off the the world title challenge um I interviewed him about that recently fantastic achievement but that opens up the you know the broader question of um your proudest moments as a coach because obviously mm -hmm. you've got in the gym you've got a lot of talent um you know with chris jenkins of british and commonwealth with liam williams and 
everything that he's accomplished. You know, I, I'd be here all day with that one. Obviously, Jay Harris, obviously, uh, you know, Reese Edwards, um, and obviously a few of the boys that, you know, sort of just getting going. Um, and, and on and on it goes. And I, I've missed one or two there. But the point is, out of all that, I mean, or maybe something else, maybe someone else you've trained over the years, out of the whole, um, you know, broad scope of that, what is your proudest moment uh, as a as a coach, as a trainer? Yeah, um, look, again, it's it's a good question and it, it leads to, to so many answers. I'd be here all day um, and I think it would be, I think it would probably be unfair to pick one, to be honest, Liam, because um, the, the success, I think the success in the nights that we've had when, when some of the boys have, have won titles, I think they, they far outweigh the pleasure that I had winning titles, you know, because it's, it's, it's more of an achievement. Whereas when I won titles, I felt, you know, happy for myself. When the boxer that I got wins titles, you know, I'm happy for myself and, and him first and, and myself second. So, you know, this, I'll, I'll just mention a few for you. I mean, um, you know, Gavin Reese won, won the British title um, against John Watson, blew himself out in the first six rounds, died of death, head, head was in my hands and then um, anyway he, he had his second wind landed a good shot and then stopped John and I think I think it was the 10th round or 11th round um, Nick Blackwell stopping John Ryder his third attempt to win a British title third time lately as they say you know that was a that was a massive win for Nick um, Enzo Macronelli Enzo Macronelli uh, knocking out over McKenzie in, in Cardiff when there had been a lot of skullduggery. There had been a, a lot of people, you know, saying that Enzo was finished and that, that, you know, he should never be boxing and, you know, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be encouraging him to box and stuff like that. Now, Enzo was past his best at that point, of course, but we worked on different things. We worked more, more on defence. And as I say, you know, he was a, he was a big underdog going into the Oval McKenzie fight because at the time, if you remember, Oval was a was a killer. He was knocking everybody out. So Enzo took some big shots, and he stopped him in the eleventh. You know, that was another good memory. Um, Chris Jenkins beating Johnny Garton. You know, so so much bad luck for Chris. So many so many huge cuts, always from head clashes. Never ever been cut from a, from a punch. Never ever got all the replays to show it. No matter who wants to argue with me or not, he's never been cut from a punch. Um, Jay Harris, um, Paddy Barnes, even better than that, Jay Harris against Martinez because, okay, he lost. But sometimes you actually win when you lose because everybody saw what kind of level that he's at. Um, I think they saw that again in, in the Paddy Barnes fight, mind, to be honest. But then the fight against Martinez, I think... He came out of it with a lot of plaudits and, and, and uh, you know, big top people, Eddie Hearn, um, too many to mention, you know, all over Twitter, you know, basically singing his praises for the performance he put up. I mean, Jay looks like he'd blow away in a, in a strong wind, doesn't he? But you put him in the, in the ring and uh, he's a ferocious, he's a ferocious little fighter. There's, again, there's, there's, there's so many, you know, Liam Williams winning the British and Commonwealth titles after being out for 13 months and being told by the, the best surgeon in the country that he'd never fight again because his hand was so bad. Um, Stop Chris Carslaw in two rounds who'd never been off his feet in, I think, 40k, one or k, two fights. So there's so, there's so, there's so many. I, I really hope I haven't left anybody out. Um, but there's no, there's not one favourite. I think they, they, they're all, they're all way up there and have gave me, you know, brilliant, brilliant nights and memories that I'll never forget. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a tough question in a way because I'm, because I'm not really, I mean, on the one hand, I'm sort of unintentionally saying pick favourites when I'm not actually meaning pick favourites at all. I'm just, I'm just meaning the ones that, that you know, that stand out for yeah, you. Of course. And, there, and there's bound to be, you know, there's bound to be too many. I mean, this is just, you know, that's going to happen. There's bound to be too many to remember and that's that. But it, but it is nice to have uh, sort of an overview of that success and, and you know, all the success that you, you've had. Yeah. Um, there's one thing I want to touch on, one more sort of um, looking back type question before we move to some future plans. Is you mentioned earlier about the, you know, the business um, side of boxing, which I, which I find very interesting. I'm quite intrigued by that because 
uh, again because I often feel that a lot of boys come into you know into fighting they think that just being you know a very very good boxer will be enough on its own mm -hmm. uh, whereas obviously we all know that obviously that's essential but it's not enough on its own so in terms of the um, business side in terms of that how do you sort of advise people and I know again there's only so much you could probably go into publicly and that's fine but in terms of steering people away from uh, certain corruption that goes on because obviously you know we, you know we all know that happens in terms of making the right sort of um, financial decisions because at the, at the end of the day you know I mean one of the things is you, you want to uh, from boxing set yourself up to be uh, well you know financially secure and, that, yeah. and and a lot of people don't um, yeah. well again I'm opening up a big question it, it can it could it could lead anywhere but I'm just curious because you're, you're big on that side how do you sort of steer uh, and in terms of your management as well how do you sort of steer um, fighters in the right business direction and what's some of the advice that, that you give as well? Most important advice I would give. Um, the first thing, if we go back before that question, the first thing would be something that you didn't mention then. The first thing would be that you, you have employment other than your boxing, okay? The best way to do it is when you've had 10 or, 10 or 15 fights, and this is an ideal world, mind now. Okay, you need you should try to get into the position where you shouldn't have touched any of the money for your t first 10 to 15 fights. That's why I said about employment outside of boxing. If you've got employment outside of boxing, some people have got full time jobs. Okay, some people get up first thing in the morning and they run and then they go to the gym after after work. I take my hat, hat off to guys like that. Um, if that's the case then they've got a good wage coming in. There's no need really to touch the boxing money or just touch little bits of it. So, you know, I had, I've had a couple of guys who literally haven't touched the first 10, 15 fights. They haven't touched any of the money because they've had jobs outside. What, you know, and, and look, you can imagine a chunk of that money could be used to get a deposit on a house. Um, another one is obviously I put, I do it through a limited company instead of doing it through you know, Gary Lockett or whatnot. I always did mine through a limited company because you get um, good tax relief because of the limited company aspect. Um, and then I invested in, I started investing in property um, back in 2003. So um, if I had a big fight, if I had 10 grand, I'd take five or six grand and put it down in a deposit for a house because back then, um, or the areas I bought anyway, up in the Gwent Valley, I could get them quite cheap. Um, so, you know, that was, that was a couple of things that I did. Um, so I just think it's always, it's, it's always very important to have other things, to think of other things rather than just thinking I'm going to be a world champion and I'm going to be famous and I'm going to earn lots and lots of money. There's more to life than boxing. So I think you have to think outside the box and make sure that, make sure that you've got some, some, you know, plan B to fall back on. Well, it's, it's good advice, Gary. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's very, very, very good advice. And it's, it's one of those things that, um, obviously, I completely agree. I mean, that goes without saying. But having other strings to your bow, as, as they say, and um, having other things going on is, is essential because you do hear so many fighters who come out and they're, you know, a lot of the money's gone. But then you hear other ones that, that set themselves up very well. And so it's, it's interesting to sort of hear the, the different... Um, a different advice there. Well, let me just interrupt you. I mean, I, from what I just said, um, exactly what I said about not touching any of the boxing money, um, Jay Harris would be a good one to speak to about that because um, he saved a lot of money through uh, through his boxing. Because, and I can remember, I can remember his first purse, and I can remember his second purse. The first purse was about 120, 140 pound. I think the second purse then was about 2,600 pound. Um, but fair play to him, he's not touched uh, a great deal of that money and uh, he's in a pretty good position. He's got his head switched on, he's got his head screwed on properly. Mm. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear it. I am glad to hear that actually because that's, that's what you want at the end of the day. Uh, I mean, because in a lot of ways it is reasonably short, if, you know, as a career in terms yeah. of, uh, you know, in terms of someone's actual whole life. So, um, so that's, that's good advice. Let's talk about some some future plans then. Uh, let's talk about, and I know at the moment things are a little bit sort of um, on hold from a certain perspective uh, with the lockdown and with what's going on in the world and so on and so forth. But when some of that opens up, um, 
what's what's happening next? And I know with contracts and with certain things, there's only so much you can say, and that's cool. But just as a little sort of um, overview of of what some of your future plans are and some of your future ambitions um, broadly, I'm just again, I'm just opening that up for you. Of course. Well, let's just start um, with with the plans that I know that are in place. So there was a big offer given to Chris Jenkins. And you know what I'm talking about. You know what's been in the press and what's been in the, on social media. Um, I can't really say too much about that at the moment because there's a lot of arguing going on. But all we know is that Chris Jenkins has been given a purse which is in excess of double what he's ever earned to fight Conor Ben. We're still waiting. We're still waiting for certain people to okay it. Um, Chris wants the fight. I want the fight. And his manager, Mo Pryor, has already said yes to the fight. But it's not been confirmed yet. And that's because that's because of um, Chris's own promoters. Uh, not... We're just waiting. We're just waiting. We don't know what the answer is going to be, but no news is bad news in this circumstance. In this circumstance, because obviously times against us. Uh, the date is supposed to be the 25th of July, and we need answers. And you know, why? Why would you stop? Why would you stop someone from earning in excess of double what they've ever earned? You know, he's only a kid. Um, well, he's a 31-year-old kid, but you know, he, you know, he needs the money the same as the, the same as most pro boxers do. Um, I'll draw a line under that one. Um, then we have we have Nathan Thorley fighting Chris Billum Smith. Big chance for Nathan. He's been treading water for the last I don't know how long um, since the Jermaine Asari fight, where which was an impressive knockout win for the Welsh title. I think he's been treading water ever since. You know, on fours and six rounds, nothing to sink his teeth into. So, you know, Chris Billum Smith is a very good, live, dangerous fighter. Nathan's going to have to be at his best. Um, he's training. Uh, he's training like a demon at the moment. Uh, we think that's going to be either the 25th of July or the 1st of August, maybe. These, of course, these dates are not set in stone yet because everything's so much up in the air. If you understand, oh, sure. Meredith Thomas um, was supposed to fight for the WBC Youth Title against. Um, I keep forgetting his name. I think, think Sahia Iqbal. Um, I think he's from Bolton, so uh, it's an MTK bill. Um, WBC youth title it doesn't really mean a lot but but it's a title that will get him a ranking and also it's a fight against a fellow unbeaten fighter so the kid's 7-0 and, 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 and Meredith is 11-0 and which is something now that he can really sink his teeth into and uh, and look towards and um, that's that's it for the three boxers um, but then I know MTK want to get Jay Harris out as well as soon as possible um, in an eight rounder so hopefully we get a date for Jay as well. Um, but with the other guys, it's just, cause it's just going to be a little bit longer until, until things settle down and then we can make plans for the other guys as well. Absolutely. Well, you know, it's good to have an insight into what's going on there because I know it's all a bit up in the air. So even though saying some of that, you know, things change. Uh, I mean, you know, boxing is a bit like that anyway, where, where there's certain things that have to be uh, played by ear. But then, of course, but it is good to, to sort of see how, um, you know where it, the direction in which things are moving, and I'm I'm actually very glad that there's some uh, some big fights on the horizon. Um, none of them are surprising, given given the talent of the individuals involved. But it, it's it's fantastic news to hear. You know, what's happening there. Now, there's really only um, one other thing, actually, which is actually something that I meant to ask earlier and I, and I forgot. So uh, apologies for that. But I'll, I'll ask it now. Is obviously during uh, all this, you know, all the years that you've been in boxing, uh, obviously professional boxing yourself and now into the training side you know it requires a lot of dedication and it requires a lot of um, focus uh, well it requires a lot from a person even though I'm, I'm sure it's very rewarding very fulfilling but fundamentally basically what I'm asking is what is your your why I mean because I know we've we've talked very much about the money about the business aspects uh, are there other things that come into it is it there is there love for the sport is it seeing people succeed uh, I, I'm, I know it's, it's, it's a bit of a strange one, actually, but I'm, you know, the, the fundamental um, aspect of it that, that motivates you most to keep doing what you do at, at the highest level, basically. That's, that's really what I'm asking. Um, well, it's certainly not the money. 
<laughs> you know, some some of these kids, they you know, they go in the, in these small hall bills. Some of them are not ticket sellers. Some of them don't earn a penny. And people people say, do you know he had he had fifty quid for his last fight? That's not the promoter's fault. People always look towards you know greedy promoters. Some look a lot of the time it is a promoter's fault. But it, from my experience. Um, Sometimes the kid just isn't a ticket seller. He only sells enough tickets to, to cover the opponent. Um, so, you know, I've had I had some I've had some pretty big paydays uh, with with Liam Williams, with Nick Blackwell, with um, Enzo Mack, Gavin Reese. But then for every big payday you have, there's a, there's <laughs> there's probably a hundred or two hundred where you were next to nothing. But so it's certainly not money that motivates that, that motivates. Um, I don't know. I think it's, you know, we have a good team of fighters and you become very close to them, don't you? So I make a commitment to a fighter, then I want to follow it through and I want to take the guys as, as far as I can take him. And, you know, if he if he comes out of it with a few quid, then absolutely brilliant. Um, but, you know, I, I, I was never, I fell out of love with boxing on a personal level myself when I was boxing. But then when, uh, when I got asked, it was Ricky Owen from Swansea asked me to help him in 2009. And I agreed to start working with him. And I just found that I, I really liked it. And I, th I think I've always had a coach in I since I was younger anyway, since I was boxing myself. I always used to sort of pull people aside and as they did with me as well, you know. So um, I just found that I really enjoyed it. And, you know, 11 years, 11 years later, I'm, I'm still doing it. I'm not so much a young coach anymore, but still pretty young, 43. But, um, yeah, en enjoying every, every minute of it. Oh, that's good. That's good. I mean, I just wanted to, I, like I say, I wanted to get that in there because it, it's one of those things that I like that you have sort of a very clear um, vision. I don't know what to put it into words, really, but like what we were talking about earlier, you've got, you know, the, these right principles about things, about, the, you know, what we said about the trash talking, about the business side of it. And I just, I just like that. So I just wanted to talk so it's, it's called It's called good old fashioned respect and morals and manners. You know, I was brought up in the proper way. I was brought up in a, in a, in a working class family. Uh, we did. We didn't really have a lot. We never, we never starved, and we were always, you know, clothed, clothed and and fed. But I was brought up the proper way, you know, to treat people with respect, unless unless they don't treat you with respect. And I just think, you know, in in this sport, which is always labelled the gentleman sport, why make it any different? Why try to why try to change things? Um, and I think for the you know the, the majority of people, the majority of the people are are respectful. I think aren't they? So. I just, I, that's what I believe in. You know, I don't, I try, I, some, some fighters need to do that. And if they need to do that, then, then all well and good. But, um, you know, I, I prefer it just being respectful. No, I like that a lot, um, Gary. Just, just, I mean, it's a little bit off topic me saying that, but it's just, it, it's nice to hear because, um, first of all, I like to think that, you know, I, I've been brought up a similar way and I try and apply that firstly. But secondly, yeah, I like, you know, that, uh, funny enough, um, when I went to the press conference um, for the fight that, that Nathan Thorley was supposed to be on with, you know, with all the Welsh title, and I met Chris Billum Smith there, and even though he's fighting Nathan and I know Nathan personally, I said to him, I said, um, I said to Chris Billum Smith, I said, one of the things I like about you is I said, you know, I like the way you are with your opponents, I like, you know, how you're respectful and so on and so forth, and we had a little chat about it. And uh, that's just an example, and that's a little bit off topic, but I, I, the point is, in a nutshell, I 100% um, 100% agree with what you're saying. Yeah. So really, I mean, that's, um, to be honest, that's everything that, that I wanted to talk about. Um, you know, we've covered it. Uh, we, well, actually, you know, you've answered some stuff that, that I had to ask without me asking really? it. So, yeah. Yeah. So I'm very happy with that. So thank you for that. Um, but before we wrap it up, the one thing I would like to just throw out there is, uh, is there anything that you would like to say um, to anyone watching this? Uh, at all, anything that, that comes to mind. If not, no worries. If you're all good, that's fine. But if there's anything, I'm just um, just throwing that one out there. Basically. Well, after after everything we just said about being respectful, I'm going to start trash talking someone, right? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm just joking. Yeah, oh, brilliant. No, so you're all good. That's cool. That's cool. I, just, I always throw that in there because sometimes sometimes people are holding on to something that they um, you know really want to talk about. But no, yeah. not not at all. Happy in in a good place. You know, obviously when this when this blasted um, sort of lockdown, when we're allowed out again and we're allowed to get back to a little bit of normality, then I'll be a lot happier. But um, 
smiling smiling at the moment and i know a lot of people don't think i smile but um i'm always smiling on the inside at least so yeah, well that's where it counts isn't it really on the yeah, inside of course. So that's where it counts excellent well you know gary it's, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure talking to you um i've i've really really enjoyed talking to you just on a personal note yeah and it, uh it's made for a great interview as well so so thank you no problem. It was a different kind of interview, to be honest, Liam. Some uh, some surprising questions, but some good questions as well. So, um, pleasure to catch up with you, and I'll see you soon. Yeah, I'll see you very soon. Thank you very much for watching. Um, please subscribe to the Simply Inspired YouTube channel, and there'll be more videos coming soon.